In this podcast, we discuss the different types of radiation present in our modern world, the damage that radiation from our mobile devices such as cell phones and laptops is causing to our bodies, and how to minimize the damage from these devices. Welcome to Anti-Aging Hacks. On this podcast, I interview top experts in anti-aging and longevity, and we discuss the best natural and medical solutions to bring you practical advice you can apply right now to fight back against aging. We also discuss sneak peeks at some huge scientific advancements coming in the near future that will allow us to age backwards. I am your host, Faraz Khan. Thank you for spending some time with me today. Today, my guest is Daniel Debon, who is an internationally recognized and influential expert in electronic emissions and EMF protection, with a particular focus on the effect of exposure of mobile devices such as laptops, iPads, and cell phones. He's the author of the popular book, Radiation Nation. He's also the inventor of Defender Shield, an effective radiation technology to prevent damage from these devices. Hello, Daniel. I'm excited to have you on the show today, and that is because... We've only lightly touched on EMFs on the podcast before, but I haven't had a chance to talk to an expert yet. Faraz, thanks so much for inviting me. I really do appreciate the opportunity to chat about this uh, with your audience and in you in particular. So let's get going. Let's start with you. What is your background and how did you become an EMF expert? <laughs> I started quite a number of years ago. I worked for the Bell System and I ran the technical laboratories that evaluated all the various technologies that we speak about today. In addition to that, I also established the standards. Uh, I, my organizations actually put out the definition of the standards for telecom technologies to meet. So I was pretty heavily involved with this te- these technologies that are around us for years and years um, at a very technical level. How I actually got involved with electromagnetic radiation, of course, when I used to study technologies, I would always look for crosstalk, which is the interference of one technology with another. Ironically, I never looked at one technology to a human. It turns out that maybe six, seven years ago, my sons, as sons typically do when they come visit, they put their laptops on their lap and you lose them for hours at a time. And, and uh, my wife says to uh, my sons that I want grandchildren. That can't be good for you. And so I thought about it for a second. I said, ah, these power levels are so low. I, I doubt very sincerely there can be any sorts of damage. But I said, well, let me take a quick look. So I, I went on to the research side of these technologies and look for impacts to the body that we maybe knew by now. And I was shocked. My sons had a laptop on their lap and within three to four hours, there could be immobility of the sperm and, and, and it can be long term. So I was sort of surprised because I was been in the industry for so many years and um, was unaware that there was a body impact to the environment, to technologies that we use around us every day. So, so as an engineer with background in the space, you had to do something, right? I actually built them a device. I'm a mechanical engineer by trade, although I was in electronics my whole life. And I built them some technologies that actually shielded them from the, uh, using the laptops, uh, not allowing the signals uh, to be uh, transmitted into the groin area. The, the, their friends liked it and their friends' friends liked it. And all of a sudden, I became more and more involved bringing solutions to the marketplace. In fact, even for that matter, writing a a book on the subject, trying to help all of us understand what are the uh, ramifications of exposures. Um, And so um, a few years ago, I released Radiation Nation along with my son, which is um, a discussion about what it is and what do we know from science on what it is and what are the things we can do about it. So Believe it or not, I was a reluctant participant as an electromagnetic radiation expert, but I had a lot of user experience. Well, it seems like you stumbled onto that, which is where a lot of the best discoveries in the world have actually come from. So I read your book a few days ago, and it really changed my perspective. I've been worried about EMF for a while, and I've been starting to turn off some of my devices, but 
some of the information you have just blew me away. So before we get into that, including the sperm and mobility, I want to talk about, were you at the Bell Labs, the AT&T Bell Labs? Yeah. Yeah, that's where I started quite a number of years ago. And I'm not going to tell you when. Because <laughs> then I give my way, age away. <laughs> that's all good. You're on the Anti-Aging Hacks podcast, so you're much younger than your years anyway. So no need to tell your age. What I wanted to ask you, Daniel, Bell Labs created the transistor which makes your cell phone and computers work. Yeah. Cellular telephone technology, solar cells, yeah. lasers, and satellites. Like, I mean... The innovation that came out of those labs is astounding. So, so you must, one, you must be a really smart guy, and two, you must have been surrounded by some of the smartest folks on the planet. I, I often tell the story. I walked into a friend of mine's office, and he was a, a signaling for years and years and years. And he was telling me about this dream he had. And the dream was that um, he had decided he could, invent an encoding to put more data content on a twisted pair of wires. When I went in, I understood the word hello. And when I left, I understood the word goodbye. Everything in the middle, I did not understand what he was talking about. He was so, so bright about this subject. And uh, you're right. Uh, everyone I worked, everyone around me was so bright. It really humbled me uh, having a chance to work with such wonderful, bright people. Well, congratulations on having really good credentials then. Let's get started with what I'm thinking is we should start with some definitions. In your book, you've mentioned there are two different types of EMFs. So what are EMFs and what are the two different types of EMFs? No, there's two types. Anything that's electronic that operates motors, hair dryers, vacuum cleaners, all of those devices, when they, when they consume the energy, at the same time, they emit emission called extremely low frequency emission, almost all of it is 60 hertz. In other words, it, it operates at 60 cycles per second. When you talk about emission from the wall, from the lights around us, anything that operates electricity, it's generating typically 60 hertz of emissions. And these kinds of things are actually fairly important because they actually influence the body. Um, we know through uh, lots of research that there's impacts at a, a variety of levels, including, by the way, the heart. Um, when you're close to these kinds of things, it does uh, adjust the heart's uh, traditional uh, rhythmic uh, flow. Um, so there's the extremely low frequency stuff. And then, then there's this stuff we have in our laptops, our tablets, our cell phones, and that's called RF, radio frequency signals. Um, they allow us to transmit information from our devices to the Wi-Fi, from our cell phone to the uh, cell tower. These are uh, typically one to two gigahertz. That's one to two billion cycles per second. So all of a sudden, it's moving much, much more fast than uh, the 60 cycle stuff from your house. Uh, from your electrical wiring, and it can be um, come up with its own set of problems for the body. And, and so um, you're worried about that transmission because it's a three-dimensional, uh, three-axis si uh, signal. That is, it, if you put your finger up in front of your head and you look at the tip, pretend there's a tiny little ball. It's opening up, opening up, opening up, opening up. It fills the entire room. And for a cell phone, for example, it can go up to four or five miles. It's omnidirectional. It's going in all directions. In other words, it's hitting you while it's hitting the cell tower. So um, there's those kinds of environmental changes that are occurring. That is, all these devices in our lives, they're all transmitting something, and they're all omnidirectional, and they're filling the room. So the two types are ELF, which, as you said, super low frequency mainly from circuit boards or electrical wiring. Hopefully, this is the low-impact one. And then the other one is the radio frequency, which comes from the cell phone towers, the Wi-Fi, the Bluetooth, which is in every device, basically, that we carry around with us. And this is moving much faster and maybe more problematic. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Good characterization. And now I'm going to explain what a radio frequency signal is around 2 gigahertz. Believe it or not, 
you know, microwave oven, should you use it? I don't. But if you were, it generates a 2.3 gigahertz omnidirectional signal. It heats the water in between the cells. The cells oscillate and voila, all of a sudden you have cooked meat. So a RF signal is a microwave signal that's touching your body. Wow. That cannot be good. And I want to, nope. I want to come back. I want to come back on the microwave uh, as a topic. Before we dive in, Daniel, as you know, as humans, we are very visual creatures. If we cannot see something, then it is very hard for us to imagine it. And so as we're learning about some of the dangers of this radiation, there's still a lot of skeptics out there saying, oh, no, 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 that's not true because they can't see it. And I think in your book, you reference that the same thing happened with cigarette smoking in the 70s and 80s. We couldn't see the damage, so we didn't believe it for a long time. So let's first talk at the smallest level on the body. What changes or damage can EMF radiation cause to the cells in our bodies? There is two forms of radiation that have been around for a very long time. The Earth itself generates a DC something around 12 cycles per second. Very, very, very low, extremely low frequency stuff. And then, do you know when you look at the sun and you see all the lights and all the colors, that's called visible electromagnetic radiation. It's actually a form of radiation that comes from our environment. Those are the two that have existed since the dawn of man. Everything you and I have talked about so far is man-made. It's the stuff that's becoming involved in our lives, never existed before. And in fact, only for the last 10 or 15 years do we have any growing track record of understanding this problem. But to the point you made before, I, when I was 12 years old, quite a number of years ago, um, uh, and I'm not going to tell you <laughs> still. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, I smoked cigarettes because I wanted to be a big man. And um, I often point out that in hindsight, research knew at that time that there were dangers, but it wasn't public domain. It was only public domain after the, uh, the um, smoking and cigarette industry began losing in court. And so for, for 20, 30 years, the damage was occurring. Science knew it was a damaging and direct link to cancers with lung cancer and smoking. Yet um, the public domain didn't know until they started losing in court. So I use that parallel because um, research does know quite definitively that there are damages to the body down to the cell level. And it also has influence to the body function. And the question you were asking, well, what can happen down to the cell level? And what we know is that it can generate an oxidative stress to the cell. It actually says, I don't like what this exposure is doing to me. And it actually can create a, a, a sequence of events that actually can break down the cell and, and can actually penetrate the cell with calcium. And then you can have uh, oxide build up inside the cell and you can have DNA damage, mutated cells. So it can be really down at the really l l lowest co common denominator of the body. So we, we know from, from research, we actually now know how the cell breaks down and why it breaks down. It, it, it irritates the cell, cell membrane and it breaks down. So oxidative stress, of course, compounded with other stresses in the body, can actually become pretty lethal to the body. What about studies that have been done on people? Well, here is a si significantly statistical study that was done in the U.S. by the federal government, the National Toxicology Program. They went out to set with the objective of finding no problems. And are, sadly for them, they found significant increases in cancer rates. Also, right after that, there was a similar study in Ramazani Institute out in, uh, in Europe, uh, out of Italy. And they did virtually the same thing. And they found virtually the same kind of uh, results. So now we have these very, very large uh, epidemiology studies that, that found similar results. 
And so if I was a betting man, I wouldn't bet that that's not uh, a problem. I would say it's statistically significant evidence led by epidemiology that's always a leader in research and science telling us our environment and how we respond to toxins. Yeah, that definitely seems like some scary stuff. And I, I looked at the study you had, you had listed the study in your book, uh, which I researched a little bit. So again, um, crazy stuff. Let's dive in deeper. What I want to do next is to talk about the devices that we use in our lives and how those could be impacting or the effects they could be having. So let's start with cell phones, Daniel. How many emissions does a cell phone have? <laughs> Wonderful question, Faraz. Um, when, when you would think that there is a transmitter that's connecting to a cell tower, and you need to be worried about that potentially. Well, actually, as you pointed out earlier in your show, there's the Bluetooth transmitter. That's dot three watts per kilogram. There's the uh, Wi-Fi that can be up to six uh, kilowatts. And there's the cell connection, which is 1.6 watts. And so you can have at least three transmitters out of one cell phone. And you can have an additional extremely frequency emissions because of the as a byproduct of the cell phone itself. So you can actually have as many as four, believe it or not. That is crazy. So let's dive into those. Thank you for giving the signal strengths, and I'd like to kind of talk about what those mean. What's a safe signal strength? So you said wireless is 1.6 watts per kilogram, Bluetooth is 0.3 watts, Wi-Fi could be 6 kilowatts. What's safe for the human body? They, they argue um, none. And the reason I say that is because it's not existed in our environment. Our body actually doesn't know how to deal with such a low-level signal. So th they talk about um, it has to be below three, uh, dot three watts, and you should be safe. But they weren't fully aware of the standards and study work that was going on. From a conservative point of view, you really sort of want to watch that you don't have prolonged exposures, uh, long durations uh, with uh, the, the technologies from your cell phone for the, for, to your skull because it's literally potentially interfering. If, if you use your cell phone and, and you use it for five minutes, you, you don't have any real concerns whatsoever because it really does take time uh, before there's a cumulative effect of these kinds of things. So um, you're, you're pretty safe. But if you're on it for an hour at a time or your kids are, that, that's when you start getting a little bit more concerned about these kinds of exposures. Okay. Let's talk about where we hold or store our cell phones as we walk about our day all day. So, for example, men are putting their cell phones in their pant pockets, which is very, very close to their reproductive organs. Women probably do the same, uh, either in their purses or in their or in their pants. And definitely, I've seen girls that put it in their breasts, right, uh, or ice against, or in their bra, I should say. Right. And then finally, as you mentioned, we're talking on the cell phone against our head, yeah, against the brain, which right. is also dangerous. So let's talk about those three areas: so the reproductive organs, the the breasts, and then the brain. Okay, we we, we talked about the brain to a little bit. Of, it really takes very very little. Uh, power from a cell phone, and you put three transmitters, a Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and, and a cell phone transmitter all to your head, um, th that can be pretty dangerous. The breast, we already know from research that you can get, th there is, um, they call it tocicine syndrome. It actually, the transmitters on the, on the, on the uh, cell phone against the breast can actually uh, m mark the breast. And we know that there's statistical significance when you have uh, it on your breast. Uh, it can convert to cancers over time. Um, that's been pretty clear. We've talked a little bit about men and the impact of the sperm. What we, we haven't talked about is more long term. I don't know if you've noticed the trends for uh, um, the male um, fertility is, is actually declining pretty rapidly. Um, if you go to a specialist, one of the first things they're going to ask you is, do you have a cell phone in your pocket uh, for that reason? But, but here's a, something that really is not spoke about, but, but, but could be as problematic, if not worse. 
when you have a cell phone transmitting constantly in your back pocket and you're a 12 year old girl, we know uh, through study work that it can impact the egg. We, we know it can disrupt the egg and can create actually a mutated cell. That mutated cell can actually be transferred into subtending generations. So there's a bit more sinister kinds of results as a, as a, uh, from a cell phone. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. If we look at the birth rates or the fertility, sorry, the fertility in the Western world, it's declining very rapidly, as you noted, against the developing world. And so you ask yourself, what's the difference? Well, one, they're maybe eating not so many packaged foods. So yes, food could be a challenge because now everything's in a box here. But two... It's all these EMFs were hyper connected across the country and in North America, for example. And so maybe right. that's also causing challenges. And the point you made with with the DNA or or the cells being mutated, right. the mitochondrial DNA is passed from the mother to the child. And so if that mitochondrial DNA gets damaged, then that's just gonna go into the kid and that's gonna be the damaged cell yep. of the DNA. That's right. Exactly. And, and, you know, we, we talk about that kind of stuff. What we haven't talked about is like with a cell phone, when you put it to your head, we, we've had um, we've had a, a, an increase in brain cancers for the last 10 years. Uh, and it's grown 2 percent compounded every year for the last 10 years. Why is that happening? I'm not even worried about that as much as I am the foggy brain. The um, the anger, the other biological uh, neuro neurological impacts to the bo the brain of young kids. A, the standard was created 35 some odd years ago. It was based on the use of a six foot male, occasionally using a cell phone. It allowed the signal to go into one inch into the male's six foot male's head. And it allowed the temperature to increase by two degrees. Remember the thermal thing related to microwave? It's allowed to heat up by two degrees. So at that time, we thought that would be the use of a cell phone. Well, well boy, were we wrong. You have children six years old that are calling their grandma talking for an hour at a time. That signal goes right through their head. And it heats up their head. What is the impact? I don't know. We don't know. Yeah, the standard's completely outdated, as you said. It was, of course. It was what is it, 1996? Where? Yeah, yeah, right. And 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 they were constraining the thermal impact, not the biological impact. Right. And of course, almost everything you and I have chatted about is biological. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I agree. Now, the only plus that I see in this generation, and, and I never thought I'd be saying this, but people are texting way more than they're actually talking on the yeah, phone. Right. So, That's right. So they're saving those, themselves from brain problems and brain cancer, but at the expense of just ADHD, just you know, just non non communications and not actually building real relationships with people. But but we digress. Yeah. Uh, I had a follow up right. question on the sperm mobility, as you mentioned, it reduces that by twenty five percent within a very yeah. short period of time. Is that three because, or four hours. Three, four hours. Is that because the mitochondria is being affected yes. or the cells being yes. destroyed? No, it, it's the mi mitochondria that's uh, uh, um, where the cells actually become more and more immobile as the t exposures occur. That is actually a, um, a, a point in time study. Mm -hmm. But we know for sure that there's more long term stuff going on. Yeah. So it's not just the. The the, uh, the reproduction of the uh, of the sperm itself that recovers, but it's the ability to recover that's becoming more problematic, as you pointed out before. Got it. And anything to do with mitochondria, I really worry about because that is the energy production of our body. And if we're reducing the energy production, then one, the sperm can't can't swim fast enough to get to the egg, which is what problem in itself. But two. Day to day life, we just need more energy to perform better, and if you're cutting that out, that's very bad. So there's there's a myriad of kind of subtending stuff that goes on when you use a cell phone. You it's not just the cell. In fact, as I said before, I'm more worried about the corollary stuff that's going on, not the cancer to the cell, uh, frontal lobe cancer cell. It's the other stuff. Like for example, if 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 you put a cell phone next to your bed. 
and it's it's pinging all night, you may have problems sleeping. Why? Your melatonin, the, the stuff that lets you sleep, is being disrupted by the cell phone patterns that are emitting from the cell phone every every so often, and it, and it is impacting the way you sleep. So there's much more kinds of impact beyond the cell itself. Okay. Let's touch on what can we do to reduce functions of the cell phones or prevent the damage from a cell phone in particular? Uh, by reducing the amount of time. Time reduced is good for the body. So that's a very simple thing you think about. D- the duration of the, uh, of the use of all of our technologies around our bodies. W- where you put it, how close it is to you is impacting. In fact, the rule of thumb is if, if you're using a, a cell phone and it's directly to your head, that's sort of the worst condition that can be created by a cell phone. Um, if you take it and put it one foot away from you, 80% of it's uh, gone. It will not impact. It's a logarithmic function. The power levels drop really, really fast. If you're four foot away, it's 98%. It's almost like just by four foot away, you're really, really pretty safe. So you really want to think about that. And and uh, something we haven't mentioned, but uh, you, sh- you, I, I should, the number of transmitters in a room, you always have to reduce that. In other words, we talked about a Bluetooth Wi-Fi and a cell phone uh, transmitter. Do, do you use Wi-Fi all the time? Do you use your Bluetooth? Uh, I don't. Um, if you can turn them off, you turn the potential risk of that exposure down by uh, two-thirds. Um, and, in fact, the general rule of thumb is uh, one bee can, um, can bother you, but that's it, unless you're allergic. Uh, a thousand bees will kill you. So, so you, you think of that analogy. Anytime you look at um, your environment, how can you reduce the transmitters in the space? How you can trans, uh, reduce transmitters in your room? Um, when you have, use a, a laptop, for example, do you need Bluetooth or do you need Wi-Fi? You, you can actually cut an Ethernet plug, plug it into the wall or into the Wi-Fi. And all of a sudden, those transmitters are turned off. That's pretty important. Believe it or not, turning those couple of things off really reduces risks a bunch. Yeah, so agreed 100%. About a month ago, I was wisening up to some of this stuff. So I started turning off my Bluetooth off at all times unless I needed to sync up with my Aura Ring. But before that, it was always on. And I, I didn't even realize it was doing all this damage or potential damage to my body. Then what I've started doing is when I go to bed now, I turn my phone on airplane mode and I use it to kind of track my movements in bed to track my sleep, but it's in airplane mode and I take off or I turn off uh, the power to my Wi-Fi, so my modem. So that's, that's off as well. But I also happen to live in an apartment complex building in Los Angeles, which I'm sure there's a hundred signals yep. all around me, which again, again is not great, but as you said, distance is good. So I'm not literally right, right. next to them. Um, so I want to move on. So that's that's the cell phone. To turn off, what you're saying is turn off the transmitters you're not using, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, as much Correct. as you can, and, and only use it right. when you need to. And and, and, and by the way, uh, um, uh, uh, it is sort of important, particularly in a bedroom. Um, when you have the cell phone like that, you really want to move it away or as you – as you just mentioned, you put it in airplane mode, but you don't want Wi-Fi routers in those rooms. You want a, 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 only a minimum number of clocks. Um, you want to take all the potential transmitters within that room out. Yeah. Ideally, you run Ethernet cabling around your house and just stop using Wi-Fi completely. Daniel, let's go to laptops next. What are the different types of emissions on laptops and how are they different from cell phones? Actually, there's not much difference, um, except that there's probably more um, ELF, extremely low frequency stuff coming off of there. When you have a when you have it plugged into the wall and you're powering up your laptop, um, there's um, they refer to it as milligauss. So you you can have a a fairly higher level of 60 cycle stuff going on that could potentially uh, infect you, but um, but the transmitters to the Wi-Fi 
uh, there are actually two types. And so um, you really want to go, as you rec- suggested, with an Ethernet connection. And by going Ethernet, you improve your speeds and you reduce risks. Got it. You know, just reading your book a few days ago, I realized that for the past year on my Mac, my Bluetooth connector had been on and I never used my Bluetooth on my Mac. And I said, what am I doing? So I went in and physically turned it off and now it's off. So it gives me a little bit more confidence. But you said, as you said, the Wi-Fi is also something we have to look at on these computers. And so now I'm going to look at how do I just run an Ethernet cable straight to my computer? Oh, yeah. In fact, um, you know, you were talking about you turn it off at night. Well, I always suggest that uh, go get a ten dollar timer that the on off kind of plug it into the wall, put your Wi-Fi on and at night at a certain point in time, have it turn off and in the morning, turn it on. You never have to worry about it again and you're going to be more safe. That's amazing. So let's talk about areas where laptops can cause damage. I typically set my laptop on my desk in front of me, so it's at least a foot, if not two, the circuitry is from me. However, I sometimes, and I see a lot of friends that are working from their laptops on their lap, which that can be good because now you've got the circuitry that's emitting the ELFs, as you said, but also the transmitter is right up against your groin area. We've covered cell phones, we've covered laptops. What about tablets? Do they have anything that's different from the other two? Yeah, actually, it's less uh, DC, extremely low frequency stuff. They they tend to be um, less invasive um, when it comes to that. But the Wi-Fi is literally the same Wi-Fi transmitters uh, that's on your tablet, that's on your cell phone, that's on your um, laptop. So um, they bring sort of a similar concern um, as all other devices we've talked about. Okay, so turn your Bluetooth off on your tablet when you're not using it and also keep it away from your lap because I think the tablet in particular, you just kind of hold it away from you and it ends up on your lap more likely than not. Right, yeah. And and by the way, you know, we we talked about kids um, with a cell phone before going right through their head. Um, Think about the, the, the groin area of a child. Um, the, the, it's the, really the soft tissue that's the most potentially uh, um, endangered. And when you are have a have a child that's using a laptop or a tablet and they have it in their lap, it's probably three times more dangerous to the child than it is to uh, the adult, only because of their biological makeup. Yeah. Yeah, so men or children, if you're listening, please keep these devices away from your groin area. Do not fry your balls. Right. And and women, don't mess up your ovaries and your eggs. (laughs) Exactly. Uh, All right, let's move on to smart meters. This is something else you talk about in your book, Daniel. What, so for the audience, what do you mean by smart meters? You used to have a utility person come to your land look on a wall at a meter and write down how much power you used. A smart meter eliminates that individual having to be dispatched. It it basically is a cell phone that connects to uh, uh, a central device, which can now look at what usage your, your house has with power consumption. And so that smart device is now um, transmitting essentially a, a, cell, a cell signal periodically, depending on the function it's in, uh, every second or so, or it could be every 10, 20 minutes or so. So these, these transmissions are another bee in the room. People ask, um, is this a, a, something we should be concerned about? And I often respond by asking where they, their meters are, because if it's on the garage door and you have your cars and then you have your living quarters, you've got over 20 foot, 24 foot between you and the, and the transmitters. In other words, the distance keeps you pretty safe. If you have um, um, a meter, a smart meter, and it's literally on the wall where you have your head when you sleep at night in your bedroom, move your bed 
because that's a constant transmission throughout the night uh, that you really want to avoid if you can. Um, and so smart meat is, there's a lot of debate about it because they're just another bee in the room. And why create more environmental toxins within the environment if you can avoid it? And that's why there's controversy about that stuff. That makes sense. I've been meaning to walk outside the building and kind of check out where the smart meters are, and I'll do that today. Um, let's move on to, you. we touched on this, the microwaves, Daniel. You said they emit 2 to 3 gigahertz of frequencies, which, of course, can be damaging. Now, do you recommend we completely eliminate cooking or heating food in the microwave? Uh, for, for a different reason, I do. Um, and the reason why it, it creates carcinogenics within the food. When, when, you're, cooking, when you're cooking something, it actually changes the atomic um, definition of, the, of that cell. It can become a carcinogenic. So for that alone, you don't want to use it. Um, if, if you do choose to do it, then when you uh, cook a, a food, you definitely want to stay away from it by um, at minimum four foot. Uh, more like 20 foot if you can. Most people, when they're cooking food in the microwave, just stand and stare at the food about a foot or two away. So, right. and, I, and I'm guilty of that. Right, exactly. So, yeah. So, I'm going to cut yeah. down on microwave use or eliminate if, <laughs> if I can. And and if even if I do use it, I'll just walk away. Right, right and, exactly. And you can do that, you know, yeah. um, because that little bit of distance you put between it really yeah. does change the impact it will have on your body. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a simple thing to do. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on to the next item on my list, which is X-rays. What are your thoughts on these rays and the radio frequency being emitted out of those? An X-ray is, you know, we, we talked about um, two gigahertz. Well, we begin talking about terahertz, trillions of cycles per second. When you talk about an X-ray, a gamma ray, um, an atomic bomb, you're talking about the potential damage to a cell. Um, it's called ionized radiation. And what ionized radiation is, is where they take um, a cell and there's a neutron and electrons. Electrons are running around the neutron. And there's so much energy that's being created by this electromagnetic radiation. It knocks out the electron and it charges it. That's why they call it ionized. And so what happens is there's a more direct path to um, the breakdown of the cell. It's more obvious. Historically, people have known x-rays can be seriously dam damaging and dangerous to the body uh, with a long history. <laughs> I often point out RF signals have been around probably, uh, you know, for the last 50 years. Uh, personal uses last 10 years or so. And, you know, you asked me before, is, uh, you know, is there something we should worry about? Well, when the, the lady who invented x-rays died of radiation poisoning, uh, uh, in other words, here the inventor didn't know that ionized radiation could be bothersome and can have a, a lethal effect on the body. Um, so a word to the wise. Um, you know, uh, RF has been around this. It's not going to knock the electron out of its orbit. It won't do that. But it's the uh, constant exposures to the cell that breaks down the cell and its functions in the body that you need to worry about. Yeah. Luckily, as a society, we only do these x-rays when we go to the hospital or to the dentist. It's very rare. So, I guess that gives me some comfort. But I was at my dentist about four weeks ago, and it was time for my yearly, you know, dental X-rays. And I I sat there, and she put this this thing in my body, uh, or not in my body, in my in my mouth. And it's kind of like I think I believe a lead device that prevents it from going anywhere. And then she literally walked away to the other room <laughs> and like disappeared. And I'm, I go, "Where are you going? Yeah, I'm and, sitting here with my mouth open, and you're in a different room, like hitting a button." And, just, and and she yeah. looks out of the side to see if you're still there or not, and <laughs> then she comes back in. <laughs> oh man, yeah, yeah, you're right. I was like, where are you going? Why am I in this room by myself? So I, I, I'm actually going to start considering not doing dental dental X-rays every year. 
maybe move it to every two years. Oh, yeah. Um, it, it, it's not just the x-rays. The, the actual controls within the x-ray, they, they drift. So even though they've been set to something, one thing, it actually can be something else. There's a lot of regimen around that, but it used to be like when you go to an airport and you run through the x-ray machine, they were notorious for lack of control. So when you had a, um, a, a shot of x-rays, it becomes accumulative. Every time you go through, the body says, I didn't like that even more and more and more. So you really want to avoid it if you can. I want to circle the wagons and come back to these home devices. The gist of what you're saying, Daniel, is the devices that you use day to day, turn off the transmitters where you're not using them. Would this apply to alarm clocks and hair dryers and refrigerators and toasters? How how dangerous are some of these other devices that we plug in? Well, you know, it, it, a, a good thing about it is when you have toast in and you're making toast, mm -hmm. you you probably put the toast in and you walked away. Yeah. So you have distance. Uh, when you dry your hair, um, it may take 15 minutes, 20 minutes. It's a short duration. But believe it or not, um, you know, we, we were talking before about levels. Um, a safe level um, is less than three milligauss. That's a measurement of extremely frequency stuff. You can have a, a dryer, hair dryer, 150 milligauss. So it's 150 times that which is considered acceptable, but the durations are short. So every device that you find in your environment emits something. Um, and, um, and just out of a general rule of thumb, when you use them, try to minimize it and keep your risks down. We've got all of these devices that are generating emissions and frequencies that we should guard ourselves against. You came up with a prod or a set of products, I should say, and a company to protect people or to help people protect themselves from these. Tell us a little bit more about your company. Remember, I was telling you the story about how I got involved in this. I actually built my son's products that shielded them from these technologies. Uh, they had friends who liked it um, and wanted me to build theirs, them some, and so on and so on. Neighbors wanted it. All of a sudden, I got in the business of pr providing uh, protection devices. <laughs> right. I had no intention of being involved in this, but, um, but um, I couldn't find anything that protected my sons. So I built um, Defender Shield, a company that um, builds devices that uh, shield from these technologies around us. Um, you don't need any of my products if you manage your environment. Um, if you take the right precautionary measures and you minimize exposure times, duration times, you're fine. But if you're like me, I like to use my cell phone. So when I do, I, I like the protection and we take an omnidirectional signal, we stop it in one direction towards the head, and we let the cell tower touch the uh, transmitters. And so you can use it talking, uh, talking to your friends, and you're still protected. So I created Defender Shield, and we have a whole variety of different products from uh, blue light blocking earbuds that have uh, no uh, signals running through the wiring, and and um, cell um, cell phone protection, uh, uh, tablet protection, laptop protection. That's really cool, by the way. And you know the arc Thank the you. arc of civilization, at least now, it's ninety. What is it? Ninety eight percent of people have cell phone and smartphones. So now that's that we're already past that stage. There's there's little we can do to tell people to like to, you know go away from their cell phone habits. So I think what you've created in terms of products are really cool because I could go and I'm I'm worried about my cell phone in my pocket and even I, knowing as much as I know, I sometimes forget to leave Bluetooth on or to leave the Wi-Fi on and so it's in my pocket and it's pinging the, the whole time. I'd rather just go buy a product that somebody like yourself has made that's protecting me even when I forget. So I'm going to go get your products and, and start using them. Some of the ones, as we discussed in our conversations, are especially for cell phone in our pocket. So there's a case for the cell phone. You've got, when you put the laptop on your lap, you've got a shielding device under the laptop that kind of protects you from radiating into your skin, correct? Yeah. Yes, I do. Yeah. Okay. It prevents the signal from pressing. Great. So I'll link all of that information and links 
to your website and your products, Daniel, on the show notes of the page. I have another question for you that I ask every guest on this show. What are your top three? What are your top three anti-aging hacks or tips for our listeners? Exercise. I actually do yoga and have for the last ten years, um, and it really, it's incredible how effective it can be to offset the the, the body degradation over time. So I've found that my practice has kept me limber. I have balance. I have all the kinds of things I'm looking for. And the body's aging seems to be been curtailed a bit. The, the second um, is eating. I, I'm pretty careful about what I eat. Uh, I try to eat balanced fruits and vegetables. I don't eat red meat. Uh, it's not that I don't like red meat. I, I just um, stay away from from red meat. I, I enjoy fish and other kinds of things, but I, I eat a very healthy, very stable environment. I minimize the sugar intake. I, I do a lot of the kinds of things that help me sustain a fairly active lifestyle. And the last is sleep, believe it or not. You, you really got to, your circadian rhythm is so important and people don't quite realize it. Uh, when your circadian rhythm is off, there are subtending body breakdowns far beyond your sleep pattern that gets disrupted. And so I consider sleep and its consistency with circadian rhythm that it really is something that you should spend time making sure is where you want to be with it. Yeah, agreed. I am finally maturing enough to get into a yoga practice, you know. Oh, that's good. In, in, in men, are, we're so macho, right? In our 20s and early 30s, we just want to throw weights around and lift as heavy as we can. And that's how we get our sense of camaraderie and like bonding with other men is how much you lift and, and what your bench press is. Right. But I've, you know, now I've finally started doing yoga and structural and musculoskeletal movements. Because if I'm going to live a long time, then my body structure better be up to it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's no question whatsoever. Um, you know, when I grew up um, in all the various sports that I was in, uh, I wouldn't be quite dead in a yoga class. Right. <laughs> <laughs> How stupid that was. The reality of it is it's really, really the kind of thing that does balance mind and body. Um, and, it, and it really uh, simple practice. You don't have to do it every day. You don't have to do it every other day couple times a week typically it's enough and you really sustain a high level of uh body balance as a result yeah the other couple excuses that i made one oh it's all women in that class i don't want to be seen in there and number two is it's a at least at my gym uh, down the street it's a 90 minute class i'm like well that's two hours with all the time right. i'll go there right. and come back can it be not quicker or you know these are the excuses right. i've been making oh yeah and yeah. finally i said no more excuses i'm gonna right. have a yoga <laughs> practice and i'm gonna get mobile and very very flexible yeah it, it turns out that making excuses is only reducing your life um span so like that doesn't make too much sense if you want to control a little bit about your long, uh, longevity. Um, and so, and you really, really, I don't know about you, but I really feel great when I come out, even though I may have gotten tired because I had a long day. Um, I find that it's such a balance for my, for my body and mind having a chance to do it. No, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing those tips. I actually don't know how old you are, but we were chatting last week and you seem like a brightly, sprightly young man, so I'll give you credit. You're you're doing something right. Yeah, I'm 67 years old. Oh wow, wow. Right. Yeah. It's, uh, you got to be careful about what you eat and how you exercise, and that's what you got to be careful. You, you do right. Yeah. Definitely. You don't get. You don't get. This is not a practice run. <laughs> yeah, that's right. This is this is your one chance. <laughs> right. It's, exactly. it's not a video game. You, you right. can't come back. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Daniel, this has been so informative. Thank you so much. Where can people find you online? Uh, DefenderShield.com. Um, you can you can get access to information. We have a learning section. Uh, we have uh, podcasts. Uh, uh, we have 
um, blogs. We, we try to keep everyone as informed as possible about this subject and the most current and uh, understood information about it. Um, and if you're looking for um, our products only, uh, you have a choice of not only with our website, but you can go to Amazon. Defender Shield uh, products are in Amazon with full, uh, full lines of products there as well. Got it. And I saw a link to all of this information as well as your book, Radiation Nation, on the show notes. You've also been very kind to give our listeners an exclusive 20% off on all purchases on your website. So if you're listening and you want to purchase something, just go to the website DefenderShield.com and use the code ANTIAGING20 to get 20% off your entire purchase. Thank you, Daniel. I appreciate you being on the show. Oh, no. Thank you very much for inviting me. I really do appreciate it. You can find all the information we discussed in this episode and links to studies in the show notes at antiaginghacks.net. To make sure you get notified of new episodes, please subscribe to the podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at antiaginghacks and on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash antiaginghacks. And now for the disclaimers. This podcast is for general information purposes only and does not constitute medical advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. Please seek the advice of your health professional for any health or medical conditions.